אפשר בכיס? לא, לא חשוב. לא, לא. אני לא אעשה יותר מדי דברים בכיס, אני מעצבן אותי, אני אקח את זה אחר כך, אני לא אאבד. אשאיר את זה ככה. מה? לא, זה הקטעים. זה הקטעים, זה רע. ראיתי, פחדתי. מה הוא לקח? מה הוא לקח? אתה זה אתה הבוס שלי? כרגיל? ישראל, אתה הבוס שלו? כן. וואי, 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 וואי. Okay, thank you. Uh, Avram Neumann, the, who set up the program here, asked me to represent the history here. So uh, that's what I'll try to do. So part, first part of the history, this is the paper 71, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Just, uh, it is 71. It's not 71 slash 72? No, it's 71. It's one and two, huh? Here it is, okay. come on, I mean. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't believe me. And to make it even more historical fl flavor, my chairman is, uh, is Bob Auman. So, uh, so uh, really, I didn't quite know what to do exactly, but uh, since uh, I decided to speak about this result, which is, uh, I didn't know that it will be mentioned so many times uh, so <laughs> already. I'll speak about it mainly because, as you'll see later, there was some, uh, it turns out to be applied and used and developed much further uh, in the recent years, mainly, mainly actually by the French school. I will, I will say more details about it. Okay? So, I, uh, so this is the first work uh, joint work with uh, Jean-Francois, and I think it's his first work, his first work in game theory. Uh, so uh, the story, I will not speak too much of the folklore, uh, maybe later in these days about this, the, what happened there, but uh, I was a student, uh, it was 1970, okay, the paper 71, but this was 1970, I was a student, a PhD student with Auman, and he came back from, uh, uh, from a conference in Belgium, and he told me what he just told you here. He said, yeah, and there I, I found a smart young guy who uh, I, I explained to him uh, repeated games, games of incomplete information in 15 minutes, and he understood, so I invited him here. Jean-Francois, so uh, that's, uh, 
that's what when Jean Francois arrived 1970 first time to Israel 24 years old newly married and uh, we started working and uh, I will not really tell you how uh, because we tried things and so on but uh, let, let us go because I, I want to have time to speak about recent things so uh, <coughs> So the situation, the, I'll start with this, although it was mentioned again, but just to put order here. So we're, we're speaking of two players. That's the model of Aumann Maschler. Two players, there are two sets, finite sets, K and L. Think of them as the type of player one and player two, respectively. Uh, the type, the pair of types is chosen by some probability distribution. Uh, delta K, as usual, is the probability, a set of probabilities over K, and so for L. So the probabilities are known, and uh, this is chosen in the beginning of the game, and uh, the repeated games is played as follows. State 0, KL is, is chosen. P, uh, player 1 is informed of K, player 2 is informed of L. At stage T, as both players know the past history of the play, so it's full monitoring called later. Uh, player one knowing K, player two uh, knows L, and they choose uh, they choose an action. Okay, actually mixed action here. They choose mixed actions and. Uh, and then uh, the payoff is given by some matrices, matrices A superscript KL. Uh, the payoff of the finitely re uh, repeated games is, is average. The payoff of the infinite ga repeated games is a bit tricky. I mean, there, is a there are several ways to overcome this. There's a, a way to, to define some evaluation. I will speak more about this. Discount sum or lim soup or lim in for some Banach limit. Or, uh, which was uh, more ad uh, adopted uh, later, is to define the value without defining the payoff. I mean, to define what we call a uniform value. Okay, I'm not going to detail. So that, that was the situation. And... Uh, Aumann Maschler uh, had the following results. It was mentioned already, but let me repeat them. So, uh, 67, they, they spoke of the one side incomplete information. So, one typeset is just, uh, it should okay. not be empty, <laughs> one single. <laughs> Sorry, not empty, but single. Okay, one, one type. Okay, I just. Uh, Curved brackets. <laughs> Uh, then for this, they proved that the v, v infinity and the lim Vn and lim, uh, lim of V lambda. Uh, by the way, in this uh, presentation, lambda will go to zero. That's with the one minus delta of the previous, uh, okay? That went to one, okay? Okay. Uh, <laughs> and this is the, the operator that will play a lot, a uh, big role here. The cav of u, the, this is a function, function of p. Cav is the least concave function that is greater or equal than u, okay? And this was a crucial operator. And then for the incomplete information on two sides, uh, the in, for the infinite game, they, they proved the following. Again, Auman mentioned it this morning, uh, which means that uh, the lower value, the max mean is cav of x. Uh, this is the min max is uh, vex cav, vex with respect to q, cav with respect to p, and uh, the the issue of existence of the lim v n was was a problem again since the, I I mentioned historic uh, notes, uh, even this, this uh, situation of, uh, uh, of having, not having a value for the infinite game, but uh, the, 
the finite game, whether it, uh, they can be limit, cannot be limit. Uh, the, the, I had a previous uh, paper on uh, before this work. There was a, first of all, there was I had an example that showing that they can be such a game with uh, v infinity not non-existence and uh, uh, lim v n exist. And uh, then this was uh, some hint that this may have a limit here. Yes? What, what's the C in CAV? The A, B is the average, right? No, 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 no. CAV is abbreviation for, is from the word concave. Oh, concave. Okay. Concave. So this is the, the least concave function with respect to P. Okay, that, that's the used uh, notation. So I didn't invent anything here. Okay? So that was the situation when, and uh, this was an open problem, as, as Bob said. And uh, the first work with uh, Jean Francois was the following For repeated games, zero sum games with lack of, of information on both sides, we have that these, this does exist indeed, uh, lim vn, uh, which is the same as lim lambda goes to zero. Uh, this is a function of P and Q, which is characterized as follows. It is the unique solution of the following two functional equations. So you see phi here and here. OK, so this is uh, the maximum of U and, and phi. And, maybe, uh, and uh, take the convexification of this and the, max, uh, the concavification of uh, the uh, concavification with respect to P of the minimum, this also gives you phi. So these are two equations. Maybe I didn't emphasize enough. Uh, the U is the function. It was in previous slide. The, and the, yeah, it was here. This was the what we call the non-revealing game. The non-revealing game, If uh, imagine if none of the players would know his type, then they would play as if the, they play actually the average game here, okay? And this will be the value, okay? So this was the, uh, so uh, I will get, there are several proofs to that. Uh, uh, even in the original paper, we have at least uh, three, four versions of the proof there. Uh, but uh, I want to highlight just uh, some some ideas there. So first difficulty, and this was again uh, a serious difficulty in the beginning, is that there is no straightforward recursive formula here. I mean, a recursive formula you have when after one step or two steps you are in a similar situation that you were in the previous, in the previous step. This is not the case in repeated games of incomplete information because the types are chosen once in the beginning in the beginning of the game, okay? So after one step, it is not true that we are in a new, new game of the same kind. So this, in, uh, but to, uh, to write, a, uh, to, spe uh, to analyze a limit, we need something like that. I mean, even if really this is not the game, we need that we can use this uh, summary as a formula. And this was really the first uh, important point that had to be done, uh, we had this lemma. What does this lemma say? That the game gamma n pq, pq are the variable, has the same value as the following game. First we play m stages, okay? Then the players tell their behavior strategy to the referee. Then the posterior probability pm, qm, is told to both players. Okay, and the referee, okay, starts, pl uh, they start playing this game. In other words, this becomes now really beginning of a new game, but with these values, okay? <laughs> so it is as if a new game starting. Now, don't, don't, uh, don't ask yourself why. This is just a mathematical tool. Don't ask the why the, the referee should know and whether they should will tell him the truth or all this. I'm describing a, a mathematical uh, computation here, okay? Assume you do know it. Assume you, you don't know the, you know the behavior. 
and therefore you compute PM and QM, and then they start to, to play this game. Okay? Uh, they they played they they have they have a uh, history of moves uh, actions they play m that's m minus one history here okay you can compute the posteriors okay uh, the referee yeah they could yes they tell they it to the referee. the referee okay very good yes okay now from this if you uh, from this you get a real recursive formula I mean you have to use it again and again and this is simpler to describe the game gamma n has the same value as the game at which at each stage M the posteriors PM, QM is told to both players, is told to both players, and the payoffs corresponding to that stage are determined by new lottery according to this posterior. Okay? Now, when you have this, you have a lot, because then you can write, uh, you can write a recursive formula. And here is the recursive formula, the VN plus 1 is the value of what game? The game in which in the first they choose mixed strategies here. This is the payoff for the first stage. And then they move to another game. Now, what is this? These things need explanation, uh, although it's quite clear. X and Y are the mixed strategies. G is the payoff for the first stage. Uh, X I here, this is actually the probability that I being played, okay? And this is the, okay, thank you. This is the probability that uh, the J will, uh, is played. Now, P I and P J are actually the posteriors before, but it's easier to think of them this way. This is the probability, the conditional probability on K given X and given that I was played, okay? And similarly for yj. So we have a recursive formula. Uh, now, with this recursive formula, then we, as I said, that. Uh, excuse me? Uh, x, yeah, yes, you are right. That's a typo, that's a typo. Yes, yes, x is in delta i to the k. Yes, 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 thank you. Okay, I corrected. I corrected three typos just <laughs> about 10 minutes ago. But awesome. met, uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, here is one way to go about it, okay? Uh, uh, to, to go uh, from here to the proof. Uh, we prove that if player one can guarantee a certain function of PQ up to an epsilon, then he can also guarantee the cav over P, the vex over Q, of the maximum of u and this f, okay? And the dual thing, very good. Uh, so here is why it works. Uh, we say at each stage, you play non-revealing, at each stage you know the pm. Play non-revealing if the u is bigger than the f. Otherwise, go ahead and defend f of p and m, okay? This will actually make the make you stay on the graph of the maximum of these two functions okay so this uh, this gives you uh, gives us some inequality that if you want i didn't try to take uh, here but uh, you'll see it later in different versions that f of n plus 1 is greater or equal than the curve vex or uh, sorry the curve of the maximum of U and F N, things like that, okay? Uh, and then we define, we define this. I mean, we, we start, if you think of F what player one can guarantee, okay? Then you start with something that he can guarantee certainly minus infinity, player two can guarantee certainly this, we are speaking zero-sum games. 
and for, and then you define this sequence, CAVVEX. Now, by the way, why the VEX came in? Because uh, you are not controlling what the other is doing. The other player is moving the queue, okay? So you cannot control, uh, but as I said, it's not really a proof. I mean, uh, okay, then you, you prove that uh, VN lower bar and VN upper bar uh, converge uniformly to this solution. In other words, there are two things there that uh, we'll, see, we'll see it in a, in a minute. I mean, these two, these two sequences, one, go, one is decreasing and the other is increasing, and they, uh, they converge, and uh, one, uh, another difficulty w was there to prove that they, they're really equal, okay? And, uh, and the, finally, the, the, the way to show that they are equal is to, to take the, the set in which one is strictly bigger than the other, and to prove that this, uh, not strictly, I mean weakly bigger than the other, and, uh, sorry, strictly, but take the boundary, and the boundary of this cannot have uh, an extreme point, okay? It has no extreme point. Anyway, okay, so this is the proof. Yes? No, no, these are sequences of functions. Sequences of function. This, this is a function. This is a function of PQ, this is a function of PQ. Take two functions, uh, take the maximum, apply these two operators in this order, okay? Okay, now, oh, what... Uh, in the lemma, it was, it was random. But then you do, uh, yes. the max mean. Then you can... Yeah, you take the value. I mean, it's, it's really... I want to get... Use the, the value of the recursion. Oh, okay. Now, uh, the extensions. First of all, some of the extensions were done by us. Uh, first extension is to, to go to the dependent case. So the, the, pro the probability on K across L is, it should not be necessarily uh, a product probability or other way to say it is to take one type set, which now the type is, uh, is two types, and there are two partitions here, okay? So there are par uh, partition of player one, partition of player two, probability distribution on K, and the matrices. Uh, this requires uh, the generalization of the operators cav and vex because we don't have a square anymore, okay? We have to, to define, but this, this is done in more or less uh, uh, what, the way you, one would expect, okay? Uh, and, and, and this was important because this will be the link to what I will tell you later. Uh, we proved that this is true not to all continuous you. Continuous bounded u. Now this function u originally was a value of a certain game. What I'm saying here is that it need not be a value of a, of a game, okay? Any continuous function. That's why uh, you can, uh, this uh, the beginning of understanding why, why this can be useful to other things, okay? So this is, was already in the original paper, okay? Uh, later on, we went uh, a bit further. We were asked by several people, uh, this looks more like a mathematical programming uh, thing. Uh, uh, game theory led to this, but, uh, but uh, uh, we, can, we can think of it in a more de uh, way, in a more abstract way detached from the uh, game theory. So let us take P, P and Q to be compact and convex sets in RK. So these not necessarily simplices, okay, respectively. U continuous real valued function on P cross Q. Okay, I came, I'm back now to the, it's easier. I mean, you can do it, you can do the same with the dependent case, but I, to describe this, I, I'm back to the independent case. Okay, to the product problem. Now, uh, F is the set of all real valued functions. 
and uh, look at the, f uh, the, uh, the following pair of uh, dual problems. Minimize f subject to f greater or equal than the cap of vex of max u f. Okay? Uh, f is, uh, is here. The set of real. Huh? Uh, I think continuous. No, no, no. Uh, wait a second. Continuous, yes. Yes, yes. The dual problem is mini. Huh? Another type. Another type of. Ma? <laughs> okay. Okay, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, yes. That's mean. That's when you cut and paste. Okay. So this should be mean, okay? Uh, these two, uh, these two uh, dual, dual uh, problems of uh, what we could prove uh, is, first of all, that the, both problems uh, have the same solution. Okay, they have both they have solutions and the, the solution is, is the same. Second, the common, sorry, the common, uh, the common solution of problem one and two is also a simultaneous solution and the only simultaneous solution of the following two equations. F, F equals vex of the maximum and F equals cap of the Minimum, uh, you can you can see where it comes from. Why we we made uh, it was made sh sorry. Why it was made shorter here? Be, uh, one operator was not necessary. I go back to this. Uh, what happens is that at the limit here, when you go with this sequence, there will be equality here. There will be equality here. And therefore, uh, this function is going, the limit is going to be both concave in P and, yes, that's why, why we can get rid of this, okay? Uh, the proof was purely analytic and made no mention, except in the introduction that it, uh, <laughs> uh, of uh, game theoretical concepts or techniques, okay? So this is, this also some, some maybe some reason why it was a little bit useful afterwards. Now, uh, uh, some years ago, uh, this, uh, this concept of M -A MZ uh, operator uh, was, uh, I think, introduced by Sylvain Soran uh, as in, a, <laughs> in a conference, in a day that was organized by Francoise in, uh, in uh, Dauphine. In 2010, he gave a lecture. Sylvain Soran gave a lecture. It's very, very hard. That's him, and that's the date, just to give you. A tribute to the MZ formula. Now, he, he gave a lecture, and this was the first slide. <laughs> he started, <laughs> yes, uh, I, I tried to make him uh, print it or uh, do something with it. So here is the, this is Alban Maschler, AM, this is MZ, uh, this is only the MZ71 that developed uh, like a, a spider here. Uh, and uh, I will not, uh, definitely not uh, give you even most of, uh, of things here. But, uh, but I will give you some ideas, especially I, I will try to tell you why, why this happened, that this, uh, uh, that this uh, operator formula became useful elsewhere, okay, and show you also where. I'll mention some of these works, not, not, the, uh, not most of them, as I said. So, so my, what's the definition of the MZ operator, as Sylvain calls it? Uh, this is an operator uh, that uh, uh, maps the continuous function, here it's continuous, <laughs> the continuous functions on the, the cross product of the probability space on K and L to itself, okay? Uh, defined by that uh, MZ of U is the unique solution of equations E1 and E2 in the previous slide, okay? Not the previous, okay? That's, that's the operator. Now, uh, 
as I uh, here is here is a slide from uh, from Laraki's uh, presentations uh, in Paris uh, somehow uh, somewhere, uh, and uh, this is from his slide again. What you see here is what he's doing, and this is a generalization I think is due to uh, to him, to Laraki. Uh, uh, I think so, yes. Uh, what he does here is uh, generalizing actually the, the discounting thing. Instead of discounting, you take just any weights here. To the stages, okay. You want to you? Uh, I call them weight. He call them probability, okay. Uh, on on the real numbers, and uh, they sum up to one. And uh, the the evaluation of the stream of payoffs is this, okay. And uh, then we know that there is a value to this game. And the main question is the existence of this this is so this is generalization of the exi existence of lim v lambda if you want okay uh, uh, as the supremum of this goes to zero and okay and the main tool it just uh, did the same thing okay <laughs> the generalization instead of lim v n he did he has more now okay what G is the payoff at stage T. That's the mu stage payoff, okay? Mu is the time weight, okay? Mu is the time weight, okay? So this is one, uh, one generalization of Rida, Laraki. Uh, now, I would like to, to explain why, why this... Uh, this, this is, became maybe one of the reasons that became relevant to other fields. Uh, I want you to recall what we had before, this, this uh, recursive formula. If you look at this recursive formula, what do we have here? We have that, thank you, we have that, <coughs> we can think of PM, QM as a state variable. Okay, state variable, and this looks very much like a stochastic game. Okay, where the the state the the state is moving in this space. Okay, so this is in principle this recursive formula gives us the connection to the natural connection to stochastic games. Okay, on the other hand, uh, what what determines PQ, uh, PM, and QM? The strategy of player one determines this posterior, okay? So actually, player one controls PM. These are the beliefs of player two on his type. Think of it this way. PM is the belief of player two on the type of player one. And it's in the control of player one, okay? Similarly, Player two controls the beliefs of player one on his type. This is QM. So this really, now you see the bridge to, to differential games. Not differential because we need uh, yet the continuity, but we have, uh, think of, uh, uh, part of the discreteness here that I will come to it in a minute. We have some situation in which a certain game develops in a way that player one controls this, this variable, and player two controls this, respectively. So this is the connection to the differential game. Okay? And in, indeed, this is that was done, I, now I'm, I'm showing you uh, the, just the abstract of a, pay, a very nice paper of uh, Cardalia Gay, Laraki, and Sylvain Soran. And they do this. They do really the, the bridge, uh, uh, the connection between these two things. And what they do, what, what is needed more here is really this issue of discrete continuous. And this issue comes from the, 
Now, maybe before that, uh, I should. Mm, no, I will. I will come to that later. Okay. Uh, what they uh, another thing that uh, that is in this literature that involved the the MZ uh, operator is the following. Uh, this is uh, something that again was. Uh, what, we, what is called the operator approach. Again, it was developed, I'll say, immediately by whom, uh, in the French school, as I call it. The Shapley stochastic game model is uh, in a state space omega. Uh, we have this, okay? We have that for any f and any discounted factor lambda. We have this, which is what? Which is just the recursive formula, okay? This is the value of the game in which, in which this is the first stage uh, payoff, and this is the new, the new state that develops after a certain x and y are played, okay? Or shortly, we have here an operator, which they call the Shapley operator, that transforms a function f to t, of f, but this operator depends on lambda. So this is the this is the recursive formula of the Shapley value. Now, and the, and what is the, the result of Shapley is that the value v lambda is the of the stochastic game is the only fixed point of this operator. V lambda equals t of lambda v lambda. Okay. Uh, this operator, as I said, it was originally introduced by Rida Laraki for the discounted game, okay, to study the in, uh, discounted game based on the Shapley operator. So this is called the, the operator approach, uh, and what is this operator approach is just based on actually the recursive formula, okay? The, and therefore, having a recursive formula was crucial in this. Uh, now, by the recursive formula, uh, we can use the Shapley operator, if we generalize this notion of Shapley operator, to games with incomplete information. We have similar things uh, here. We have that these are x in, this time the k is there, y is this. Hmm? Ah, yes. So C of delta Okay. Uh, no, 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 no. No, no, no. This is not function. Uh, you are here? F, F. Oh, F, yes. F, F, yes. F, yes. Okay. And what do we have here? We have that, the, uh, notice here, this is, think of X and Y as the first, uh, first, uh, uh, the strategy of the first stage, mixed strategy depending on the type. So we have lambda times the payoff, one minus lambda, and here again, the, uh, the notation is as usual, okay? Uh, xi and yj are the prob total probability of playing i and j respectively. f of pi, pi are, are the conditional uh, uh, posteriors that used to be m, and this is, again, we have an operator here of the same form. And again, the value V lambda of PQ is the only fixed point of T lambda. Okay? And now, this can be extended also to, to not necessarily to the, to the discount factor, but to the other valuation. For instance, for, for the finite game, we have this type of... Uh, of uh, relation v n equal t of one over n. This this plays the role of the lambda and v n minus one. Okay. Uh, now. Now now come the thing that I. Uh, that I uh, mentioned before and uh, it has to be explained. Uh, Again, I think this was introduced by, uh, by Soran, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Uh, I think it's already in his thesis. And the idea is that, uh, that valuation, valuation, which is probability distribution over the 
positive integers, define a partition on 0, 1. How it is defined in the natural way, t0 is 0, tn is the sum of the mu's up to that place, okay? Now, this discrete game can be viewed as a game with continuous time on 0, 1, where the actions are constant in each of the intervals, okay? Now, now you can, you can write here recursive formulas, but the recursive formulas are with respect to what? To resp with respect to this partition. With respect to this partition. The recursive formula gives you the following. The value sub p, this is, a, uh, is the value of this game. Now what is pi, one, pi t1? Pi t1 is the normalization of the, on 0, 1, of the trace of the partition pi on the interval t1, 1. Okay, so you are at, at time t1, okay? And you want to write a recursive formula on 0, 1, value on 0, 1. So you, you normalize it again to 0, 1, the, exactly. And that's what you do. This is a recursive formula here. And, uh, you can, you can have uh, the value of a game starting at time Tn, in other words, with mu n plus m uh, is the value of Gm is given by this. Okay, rush then. So the, sta uh, the sta stationarity uh, it gives you this, this type of formula, and by taking linear extension, you are now defining a value which depends on the partition uh, of a continuous time on 0, 1. Okay? Now, why this is important? As I said, I mean, here now I, I really go quickly. This embedding of discrete game into continuous game enables using uh, what they call in differential uh, games, viscosity solutions techniques used in differential games, and it was used. Second, evaluation of discrete game, this, the valuation of the discrete game can be viewed as a discretization of underlying continuous game, okay? And uh, this was really, are uh, used for approximating the value of differential games using techniques and results from the discrete game. Uh, for example, I, ju I just give here a few examples. Uh, uh, Pierre Cardelier in his course on differential games uses this formula, the MZ formula and some elements of its proof to characterize the value of differential games with incomplete information. Uh, another game, which uh, I will go very briefly, was developed and defined by Rida Laraki, was, and this is a, uh, the notion, uh, the concept of splitting game is due to Laraki, but this, this is from a newer paper by Olyu uh, Barton, 2012. And what is there, uh, splitting game, you see, uh, again, is another way to, uh, to view these games of incomplete information. Because, uh, as I said, PM is, what is PM? PM is the beliefs of player two on my type. Now what, what can I do? How do I control this? By playing a certain mixed strategy. This mixed strategy will, will determine PM plus one. Determine it in a way that it's average will be PM, this is a Martingale. So actually I'm, I'm deciding how to split around the present value of, the, of PM. And that's, that's the way, so they, uh, the splitting game is, let, let me, since I don't have much time, the splitting uh, game is the following. Step one, uh, now this notation is, is uh, probability distribution with, aver with expectation this. So probability distribution with expectation this. Now the players 
can choose the splitting, okay? Can choose, choose the splitting and, uh, and the stage payoff is U of X, M, Y, M. If you look at it, it's just really uh, stripping the story of incomplete information and leaving just the, the dynamics of the beliefs there. And, uh, and the result of uh, the, the result that uh, in this paper is just this. Again, uh, to see again all of a sudden this, uh, these equations and, uh, as, and uh, another thing I will go quickly is uh, this is a, a PhD a student of Cardalia Gaia in differential games and uh, she, she speaks of differential games here. Okay, differential games with incomplete information. Okay, so we have this, the same story with control of variables and so on, but uh, the players have their inf private information. And uh, their control sets and so on, I, I, will, I will not have time to, uh, to... Again, you see the same setup, but they play differential games game here okay uh, the the types are uh, uh, chosen and they and, and they are told to the player they both play uh, they observe the control this is the payoff in the, in uh, in, uh, in differential game you have two payoffs this is the terminal payoff when it's finished and this is uh, the what they call running payoff along the game there is a payoff so in any way let me just show you the last layer of the theorem again. The value of this game with incomplete information where the dynamics and the, the running payoff are, are not depending on the state. And there are some assumptions there under which this is the, the value. And this is the operator phi, the M, what Sylvain calls the MZ operator, appears here in the, in the solution of the value and appears here in the differential equation that uh, that plays. And finally, uh, just uh, a seminar that I missed last Sunday. Here is another generalization of the Mertens Amir uh, uh, 71 thing. This uh, Jerome Bruno is sitting here with co author. Uh, generalize this, uh, I think a very nice generalization is that uh, uh, this, uh, the type of a player is not fixed, is moving. Uh, according to uh, Markov chain. And uh, the result is similar, but uh, I assume that the, among the, the main difficulty was really to detect what is the analog of the uh, non-revealing, what is the U there? What is the, uh, the non-revealing game there? Not the revealing value, but uh, my, uh, my boss is saying that I finished. Okay, and thank you. Yes. Uh, okay. So uh, thank you very much, Shmuel. Uh, now we will move on to the next speaker, who is. Uh, Anna Popinshik, a joint paper with your tent with Jean-Francois, so he is making his presence possible. Okay. Um, first, I wanted naturally to thank the organizers for bringing Jean Roussel back to be with us for at least three days here. And I'll uh, try to continue with a uh, historical perspective. Um, 
although I wouldn't be able to go as far back as uh, 1971, uh, but I'll do my best. Uh, I'll do my best in uh, maybe uh, trying to give you a sense of the process of the joint work, and hopefully by the end we'll get to the results. So um, when I was visiting court in, in spring 2005, uh, Jean Boussa asked me, what do I think about social discount rate? I had no idea what to answer, so I continued listening. He mentioned uh, this, uh, this uh, document, a memorandum, which is written for bureaucrats uh, for the, uh, that, that is used by the executive branch of the U.S. government, talking about uh, cost-benefit analysis and how to calculate net present value of a public project. So a practical calculation says you have to take uh, benefits generated by a project, monetize them, and uh, sum up. Uh, using some discount rate. On the other hand, um, he mentioned the work uh, with uh, Amrita Delon, uh, saying that if you use a, a good welfare function, then um, you could give a meaningful answer to what this social discount rate uh, should be. Right. So the basic question is, when would the two calculations, one based on uh, this just rule of thumb uh, used by practitioners, and another one uh, which could be rationalized using a welfare function, when would the two calculations coincide? And if so, what would the second one tell you about the first? Okay. Uh, it gave me the sense of what, uh, what the question is, and uh, naively I said, well, I, I'll go out to lunch and, and you know, do some calculation on the board, maybe I'll give you the answer. A uh, little bit, I knew that calculation would take a little longer than, than a blackboard, and much longer than uh, one afternoon. Uh, direct calculation, in fact, gave, you know, became quite uh, involved very fast, and we were looking for an indirect way to answer the question, which uh, came to us um, January 2006, uh, in fact, uh, during a short visit to Yale, when uh, both of us uh, read the original of, uh, presentation of Karl Magarov's uh, uh, take on uh, generalized functions and uh, derivative of generalized functions. And in fact, the, the problem fitted exactly that framework, provided we uh, could impose time invariance on, um, on the welfare function, okay, welfare defined on a set of, uh, of, of policies. Uh, time invariance means that when you shift a policy in time, uh, the welfare of that shifted policy is just an affine transformation of the unshifted policy. And these, the coefficients of the affine transformation depend on the, on the length of the shift, of course, and not on, on the time when the shift occurred. And um, that property, in fact, it was, was very powerful when uh, used several, time, uh, several times. It pinned down um, pretty much the, the, one of the coefficients of uh, the multiplicative co coefficient of the affine transformation. It had to be exponential. Then the whole problem was translated into, in fact, a differential equation in, for generalized functions. And uh, we got the result that welfare was, uh, could be represented as, as a uh, net present value um, type. Okay? And uh, as applied to, uh, to overlapping generations model, in fact, the question was about intergenerationally equal, uh, fair uh, discount rates. So we had to use several generations in, in that model. Uh, when we applied it to, to the classical macro model, we found out that uh, if the proper welfare function is used, the relative utilitarian one axiomized, uh, axiomatized by uh, um, Delon Mertens in 99, then uh, the uh, rate of per capita consumption is the justifiable social discount rate. And uh, it's quite, I mean, we were both excited because it was a highly abstract work which uh, gave a rise to a numerical answer. If you look at U.S. data, um, then uh, this rate will be equal to 2%, and uh, that's what I told uh, bureaucrats in Washington this spring. So the two, yes? Can you explain the difference, compare something that is pretty specific and quantitative meaning benefits and welfare? What are we to think about? Okay, so uh, in practical terms, when a public project is being considered, the benefits and costs of the projects are, are to be monetized. There are various 
difficulties associated, of course, with translating utilities into money, but in the end, everything is brought into single terms, monetary terms, and then one is to calculate the net present value of that project the, way, the same way as, as we calculate present value of, of, a, pub, of, of a private uh, project. And uh, that's, that's the rule that is being used in practice. The question is whether you can justify this rule or find rationale for that rule, okay? Because uh, typically when an economist is evaluating a public project, he would look at a difference in welfare that would be generated by, by a project. Okay, so the, for the question here would be when would the difference in welfare or derivative of welfare have the discounted form? Okay, and if it does, what's the discount factor which will be implied by the welfare function you use? Okay, here uh, we use the relative utilitarian welfare, which amounts to. Uh, normalizing utilities of individuals between 0 and 1 and then summing up the utilities. Okay. And again, this, uh, this welfare function was uh, axiomatized in, uh, in Econometric 99. Okay. So to make the statement non-vacuous, we needed to verify the assumptions. First, time invariance was a very natural one and it, uh, in fact is satisfied in a very wide class of uh, uh, common models used in, in, in macro, and that's the one that, uh, that we used as well. Of course, it's a, it's a joint requirement imposed both on the welfare and on the model and on the type of equilibria that we're looking at. So the, the model has to be uh, stationary, it has to admit stationary equilibrium, and then uh, you use the, the appropriate welfare function. Uh, all these would be very natural uh, ways to, to model uh, right. Uh, policy analysis, so, so, uh, very, very natural models uh, that are currently used for policy analysis and most of the macro people who, who you talk to, right, would, would start analysis of such a model with a stationary equilibrium, which we call uh, balanced growth equilibrium. Okay, so the first, uh, the first uh, requirement is uh, kind of naturally <laughs> satisfied um, in this types of, in this world, yes. What you're saying is time variance means just sheet or Yes, as I said, <laughs> Okay, so, so as I said, the time invariance means that the welfare of a shifted policy is an affine transformation of welfare of unshifted policy. And the coefficients of the transformation, the additive and multiplicative ones, do not depend on time, they just depend on the shift, the length of the shift. Uh, this, in the end, gives you this exponential, discount, exponential form of the derivative. Okay, so the time component is exponential, and then it's, uh, there is some other component which, which can't be pinned down without knowing the model. Okay? So to make the statement non-trivial, or so, sorry, non-vacuous, we had to, of course, uh, justify the assumptions. Um, differentiability appeared to be a hard one, and we had to come back again to that uh, calculation of actually trying to uh, calculate by hand, you know, hand against the wall, wall approach, uh, derivative of welfare in, in a given uh, example, in a given uh, um, model, okay? And, uh, of course, that, that task, uh, in fact, could be decomposed into two. At first, you want to look at the variation in policy and its effect on equilibrium variables in, say, uh, the overlapping generations model. And once you've done that, you can look at how the changes in the equilibrium variables would translate into changes of individual util in individual utilities, and then how to sum up these utilities into welfare and calculate the change in welfare. Okay. There were several difficulties that uh, that, uh, that awaited us. Uh, first of all, um, these models have non pareto equilibria. Uh, there were some. Uh, bad news established in the mid-80s saying that if you work with discrete time models where time starts at zero, uh, it's impossible to do comparative statics, there's indeterminacy. Uh, however, uh, good news came somewhat later as we started working on the, in this project, Demichalis and Polymarchakis published a paper in 18, 2007, saying that if you have an endowment economy with um, logarithmic felicity, uh, 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 logarithmic instantaneous utility, then um, as the 
time periods between transactions shrinks to zero, so you go from discrete time model to continuous time model, and the term is to disappear, so uh, bad equilibria are gone. Um, there were some, uh, there were some work, previous works on um, dealing or doing comparative statics in infinite economies, but they were not applicable to our case, so I'll be maybe more specific about it later. Okay. So let's see what we had to deal with here. That's a, a classical model, and some variant of it that already appeared in CAS in the 70s. So uh, the timeline is, uh, is the whole real line, so it starts from minus infinity goes all the way to plus infinity. Model is stationary, so population uh, grows exponentially at a fixed rate. It's an overlapping generations economy, so every agent lives uh, for a finite stretch of time, for a limited stretch of time. And uh, individual utility is a standard, as a standard in these models. Uh, the felicity is uh, of constant elasticity of substitution type. Individual, it's time separable, so you have, uh, I don't know where the button is, uh, you have uh, beta as the uh, discount rate. And the typical individual, an individual in this um, economy born at any point in time will be maximizing this lifetime utility subject to the regular budget constraint that the uh, value of consumption, uh, that consumption stream, C of S, over lifetime cannot exceed the income. Income wealth is composed of two parts. One is the uh, uh, wealth that comes from uh, working, the wage income, as two components, the wage times the productivity. Productivity can change over lifetime of an individual. And the first component is our policy variable. It's the value of the endowment given to an individual born at, age, uh, born at time x when he's of age s. So our parameter in this model, omega xs, is, if you wish, the amount of apples that an individual of, uh, right, who was born at time x when he's of age s is given or taken away. Okay? Omega in general, the sum of omegas is not restricted, so it can be a net transfer in or a net transfer uh, out of the economy, or it can be pure redistribution across generations. Okay? So in the baseline, the sort of the baseline equilibrium that we'll consider, omega will be equal to zero, then we change omega, we'll talk about perturbation of this endowment. And we'll have to uh, see how all the variables, equilibrium variables, will react to that change. Okay. Here's the production side, it's called Douglas. Uh, that's how we started. Um, labor um, components that will be labor available at time t um, is growing ex exponentially with time, first of all, because population grows exponentially at rate uh, new. And, for, and secondly, because productivity grows uh, exponentially, exogenously, at right gamma. So it's an exogenous growth model. Okay? There are invest investment firms in that model, and uh, they use this capital accumulation technology, which is linear as well. Okay? So it's a constant returns to scale all over, and uh, the utility is homogeneous of a fixed degree, so it's a stationary model, um, and therefore there is a hope to get stationary equilibrium, like balanced growth it all looks uh, very standard, and we were hoping to find some ready-made solutions, you know, a characterization of equilibrium of this model, but um, we couldn't find any, so we, we had to uh, work hard and really uh, uh, write them down from scratch. And um, although it looks like a two-page introduction of the model, the full characterization took 59 pages. I'll show you just uh, a part of it, of course, and uh, I'll try to highlight sort of the, where we, were, we went with so if you uh, do characterization in small letters, dividing all the aggregates by the amount of available labor, LT, okay, and you translate the policy variable omega, normalize it to become E, that will be our uh, perturbation now. It's the normalized amount of apples given at time T to an individual who is alive at that point in time is of age S. Okay? Then candidate equilibria will be described, or can be described as a fixed point of, of the system. So if you guess an investment path, okay, you calculate capital according to capital accumulation equation from that. Uh, given capital, you can calculate the output. Given 
all these variables, you can calculate uh, the interest rate or net interest rate, if you wish. From uh, these, then you'll have enough information to, uh, to calculate uh, consumption, individual consumption, and uh, aggregate consumption. And then from market clearing or material balance, as uh, jean I used to call it, uh, you'll get a new value of uh, investment. And if you happen to hit the same investment path uh, you started with, here is an uh, candidate equivalent. Okay, so a, a necessary condition for an equilibrium that, uh, for equilibria that we describe, will be a solution to this uh, fixed point problem. Okay, so that, that's that's the basic uh, system that we work. So among other equilibria, as I, as, as I mentioned, we'll um, start, our starting point will be a balanced growth equilibrium where KT is exponential and all the small letters are constant. So that's an easy one to look for. And out of this group, we'll look at a particular one uh, where um, I over Y is odd. Okay. Now, let's look at, at the problem again. Okay, thank you. So we said that equilibrium function of time, I should solve uh, this equation, upsilon minus i is equal to zero. Okay, so if you just look at the most standard approach to that problem, you want to find out how your endogenous variable, right, uh, function of time, investment, reacts to changes in parameter e. Right? You you have to use the appropriate form of implicit function theorem. And with the, uh, the appropriate invertibility condition, you can claim that you can, uh, can have in endogenous variable i, equilibrium variable i, a smooth function of exogenous, uh, exogenous variable e. Okay? It looks nice, but uh, unfortunately, um, it's, it's quite difficult to, uh, to find uh, whether uh, such operator is invertible in general in, at these cases. And, um, one could use a, a standard way to, to proceed and try to uh, maybe extend Sard's theorem, which was done uh, for reasons of the group. But uh, when we were calculating all these derivatives, I, I suddenly realized that Jean Rousseau was very happy about the fact that they all, at a balanced growth uh, path, look as uh, or can be presented as convolutions. And only later I understood that uh, there was a reason for that. Um, if you think about um, a spectrum of an operator, and here a derivative is an operator from one Banach space to another, right? By definition, what's a spectrum? Um, it's the set of uh, uh, complex uh, numbers such that that operator minus z times the identity is not inverted. Okay, that's just the definition of a spectrum, like a, a definition of an eigenvalue in a finite dimensional case. So if you take z equals to 1, okay, uh, real number, then if unity is in the spectrum of the operator derivative of upsilon with respect to e, then we're in a bad case. We don't have invertibility, and we can't use implicit function theorem. Okay? Why? Because the derivative of f with respect to i is the derivative of upsilon with respect to i minus the identity operator. And it's that difference that we want to have invertible. Okay? So if we look at the spectrum of d upsilon di, and we find that unity is not in the spectrum, then we're good. Okay? We can use implicit function there. Now the question is, how do you find out what is the spectrum of, of this derivative operator? And here, uh, what helped us was uh, the, this formulation of Wiener theorem from spectral analysis, uh, also suggested by a colleague from Colorado, from math department, saying that um, if you look at a spectrum of a convolution operator on, on LP, and it's given by a function, by an integrable function, then it's independent of P and equals to the closure of the set of values that will be returned by a Fourier transform. Okay. And in fact, uh, the closure part is, 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 is rather trivial. We just add zero at infinity. Uh, zero is not a point we're interested in, so all we cared about here was uh, what's the range of the Fourier transform of this derivative operator du upsilon uh, di. Okay? 
So now from then, the plan, it's sort of the very rough idea for the plan was clear. First, we have to make sure that this upsilon is smooth, okay, in both arguments, exogenous and endogenous. Second, we had to show, and we were sort of in the process of doing so, that the upsilon di is a convolution at a given stationary equilibrium GRE. And uh, secondly, we had to show that the Fourier transform of that operator does not return one, at least generically. Okay? Generically in the set of parameters of the model, and that's why we had a fully parameterized model, then you really have a sense of you know, what happens there in, in the space of parameters. Okay? So that was a very rough uh, outline that we had in, in, in January 07 and took us quite a bit of time to uh, get through all the details. Um, and still we, 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 we faced another problem, okay? Faced another problem that yeah. if you perturb your, your parameter, your policy parameter, E, and you get a, a smooth response of your equilibrium variable, Okay, that will still not be enough to show that you can calculate the difference in welfare. Why? Because although the equilibrium quantities are, are uh, moving smoothly and maybe even returning back to the status quo, utilities might be proportional to changes in these qu quantities, but because uh, there is an exponential growth of population, so there is more and more people, say, in the economy, you had to make sure that not only uh, differences in uh, equilibrium variables are summable, but also differences in equilibrium variables multiplied by an exponential are summable, okay? So we had to have a much stronger restrictions on the response of equilibrium variables to ever hope to get derivative of welfare um, uh, being fine, okay? So one of the maybe natural solutions would be to say, well, let's restrict the types of perturbations in endowments that, uh, that we start with. And uh, let's look at uh, perturbations and endowments that are both bounded and are summable when multiplied by an exponent to some power, okay? And so we'll, we'll look at the intersections of the two spaces, L infinity and what is called in the paper L1 lambda, where lambda stands for the exponential rate at which uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the variable converges. More precisely, uh, right, a variable is in L1 lambda when it's in L1 once multiplied by an exponential to the power lambda t. Okay? So we had to do that. A, look for uh, lambdas in an interval that uh, contains zero, of course, the, the baseline case, and repeat the previous steps, okay? Already, if you look at the previous steps, you see that we'll have to have a different version of the implicit function theorem because the, the ready made would not work. Here we work with a whole set of spaces as opposed to one particular space. And secondly, we would have to extend somewhat the, the Wiener result as well. Um, that was uh, uh, quite a, right, and uh, again, uh, quite a bit of uh, work uh, going back to, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the theoretical foundations. Um, and, you know, in the end, we, uh, we had this intermediate version, which was a core DP in, in general, uh, January 2009. However, uh, already in the summer, uh, at uh, the Society of Economic Denial Meetings in, in Boston, Jean Vazat told me, you know what, uh, this is still rather restrictive. You know, we, we shouldn't uh, have uh, the perturbation being uniformly bounded. It makes no sense. Uh, it's a continuous variable. There's no sense in, in restricting it. So, uh, so uh, I think we, we have to change the topology. Okay. Despite my very active protest in doing so, because we almost had the complete paper, he said, "No, uh, you know, you can continue working on the models that potentially could be uh, reused in, in the new version, but uh, there is no way back." Okay. So what we had to do was to uh, create a new space where our perturbations are to live, and uh, later we uh, figured out that. Some properties of these spaces uh, were already described in the literature in the 70s and 80s. 
And motivation is to separate the control of the local end and, and global behavior of, uh, of a variable. So the main motivation was to introduce uh, this uh, L infinity one space oh, in which we wanted the, uh, the perturbation, the change in endowment to live, right? So the, uh, locally it would be integrable and all the integrals are uniformly bound. So the idea was to describe, first of all, we, we needed all the tools that you, you, you know, the, the textbook uh, uh, properties of, of these spaces that uh, LP possess, uh, uh, typically, right? Uh, and and uh, our variable, our perturbation is a function of two real variables, the time and uh, the age, okay? So it's defined on R2. Um, and then uh, the idea was to maybe write uh, write down these properties for um, functions uh, from Rn to R. And then uh, at some point, uh, we started seeing that the proofs became too computational, and there are too many square roots, and uh, it's ugly. So uh, Jean-Paul suggested we should uh, work uh, to uh, describe the properties of amalgams defined on uh, abelian groups. And then I said, you know, I, I've never dealt with abelian groups. Maybe I should read something before. And uh, his answer, as far as I remember, was, well, you don't need to read anything. The only thing you need to know for the proofs is that the sum of the two groups is a group. That's it. Go to work. All right. Um, the second tool that we needed was a generalization of uh, uh, impulse function theorem. The reason why we couldn't use the existing one is, again, because we wanted to, uh, to have uh, a theorem that would uh, apply to a whole set of spaces, right? Spaces that will be indexed by lambda, by this exponential, to, right, the, that, that can be used to multiply the, the variable so that it will, uh, to multiply the, the function so that it will be in the LPQ space. Of course, what you could do potentially is to uh, to use um, the implicit function theorem formulated for every for every given lambda, okay? And then, um, as you remember, probably uh, I might have draw the same picture that was that appeared here already, right? So if you have your exogenous variable here and say your endogenous variable here, right? The, the implicit function would give you the, uh, the function in, in some neighborhood of the original equilibrium, okay? So you could apply your implicit function for every, uh, for every given space you work with, for every value of lambda. And then, of course, what you need to do is to take the intersection of all those uh, neighborhoods for which the implicit function theorem uh, works. But given that the set of lambdas is, is an interval, you could very well end up with intersection being just one point, and then there's no theorem, okay? So uh, there had to be a, a, a new formulation for that, okay? So the final formulation, which is um, roughly as it stands uh, right now, uh, takes out the, ta uh, formulates the, the uh, defines an equilibrium again as, as a fixed point system. This time we start with K, uh, because if you take uh, E, the exogenous variable, to live in L infinity 1, then equilibrium forces uh, consumption, capital, output, and this net interest rate to be uh, bounded, uniformly bounded functions, which are continuous. And equilibrium forces also investment to live in L infinity 1, so we don't need to force it to be uniformly bounded either. Okay. Uh, and, and it's uh, more convenient to work with, uh, with this map uh, from uh, C infinity uh, cross L infinity 1 to C infinity as opposed to uh, the other one, uh, where I is, is the uh, control variable. Um, and uh, this type of uh, fixed point will be an equilibrium if it satisfies in addition uh, the set of inequalities, saying that investment enhanced capital is positive, uh, some of the produced output is used as consumption. Uh, that's the non-stationary equilibria. And uh, it also uh, describes um, Bell's growth equilibria uh, when endowment is equal to zero. Okay, so the first type of equilibrium is our status quo from which we start. And the second type of equilibrium will emerge as we change the, uh, the endowment and the economy. So it's not necessarily stationary, it shouldn't be. 
Um, as you know, as as the initial uh, argument goes, if you pick a balanced growth equilibrium, there might might be several, but assume you have a selection device. There, there's a finite number we show. Um, the implicit function theorem would tell you how to find the derivative of uh, the uh, equilibrium variable, say k, with respect to a change in endowment e, and as sort of basic intuition would say, it would be a composition of the two maps. The first one is the inverse of f with respect to k, and the second is the uh, derivative of f with respect to the exogenous variable. Okay? All right. So again, to use the implicit function theorem, one has to show that the derivative of f with respect to k is generically invertible, and using the uh, general, general version or more general uh, version of Wiener theorem, uh, we can, this basically reduces to verifying that Fourier transform of uh, the upsilon decay never turns unity. Okay? Um, so one could plot some spectra of this operator. The spectra contain all the uh, values for which the operator minus that, uh, right, that number times identity is not invertible. Uh, it's in the complex plane. Of course, the graph is symmetric around the real axis. And, uh, you know, first of all, what you see is, is that it's a line. So there's a hope that if by mistake or by chance the line passes through one zero, right, it wouldn't if you re-parameterize re the, the model. So we had a lot of fun drawing these graphs. Uh, by the way, as you see, um, this one by, uh, happens to be inside a unit circle. So sometimes uh, this, uh, this fixed point map is, is, uh, right, is a contraction, sometimes it's not, as in the first case, so uh, can be anything. Okay, so the, the, one of the sort of uh, lemmas, if you wish, says that uh, uh, if you pick a generic economy, generic, once again, in, in the sense of, in, in the space of parameters, and you look at the convolution kernel of uh, this derivative operator at a given VGE, at, at this particular VGE, and then uh, the Fourier transform of, of this kernel doesn't contain one. So we can use implicit function theorem. Okay? Um, now, we, did, we wanted to push it a little bit further, as you remember, because we wanted to use basically one implicit function theorem to show two results, both the regularity, the fact that equilibrium variables are smooth as functions of exogenous variable, and also that they converge fast enough, right, that uh, there's this exponential convergence. Uh, for that, we needed uh, the, uh, right, to, to have a unified version, right, one of the necessary conditions was to have uh, the, that inverse, the FD decay, to be the same for the whole set of spaces, okay? And to uh, assure that, we had to push a little bit uh, that first statement. And instead of Fourier transform, to take a Laplace transform of tau, okay? So basically pre-multiply Fourier transform by an exponential. And ask the question, how far can you push this exponential uh, away from zero to still get, um, to still make sure that the, uh, that the transform does not return unity, okay? This would uh, define the range of lambdas around zero for which uh, our derivative operator will be invertible, and it will have the same inverse in the intersection of, uh, of Wiener algebras, which are L1s with uh, unity being uh, epsilon uh, Dirac uh, at, 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 at zero, okay? Well, can now also look at it to, to visualize this, uh, this, this interval. We took several parametric examples and calculated this interval around zero for different parameters of the models. What I wanted to, you to take from this is that this interval indeed is, is open around zero and apart from some pathological cases, non-generic parameterizations of, uh, of, uh, of the economy. Okay, so there is an easy algorithm to, uh, to make this calculation. Okay, so now we come to the results. The first one says that if you look at, uh, at the system, 
the fixed point system that uh, I described to you in one of the last slides. And then if you take a perturbation of endowments in an open ball around zero in L infinity one norm, then your resulting equilibrium will be close to the to the baseline in the appropriate metric. Okay? So this is the so the candidate regularity result. Okay. Again, an open ball is an L infinity one. Um, and this is sort of a standard first part of implicit function theorem. Okay. Um, to formulate the, the second part, we'll need a little bit of notation. If you remember, this is this uh, lambda interval around zero that we we're talking about. And uh, this would be the norm uh, used for kernels, kernels that will describe derivatives um, in, in the system. Well, the, uh, most of them, uh, most of the derivatives is, is given by the kernel up to uh, s several jumps. Um, as you see, it's a uniform metric. Um, and the requirement is that it would be uniformly uh, bounded once multiplied by a sum of extreme exponentials. Okay. So the second part of, of the implicit function theorem is the differentiability statement. It says that not only the implicit function exists, but it's also differentiable with respect to uh, changes in endowments, changes in parameters. And in fact, uh, there's a little stronger statement here. The first bullet says that the map from the exogenous variable E to the derivative of the equilibrium map with respect to E will be Lipschitz from uh, the space where the perturbations live, L infinity 1, to uh, that uh, space where kernels are, which was described in the previous slide, uh, for the values of the key uh, equilibrium variables. Okay? And as a corollary from this result, uh, you can get a, a very interesting statement that not only the initial equilibrium is close to the status quo, but also if you take two perturbations that converge exponentially in the uh, neighborhood of zero, okay, the resulting two equilibria will be uh, close to each other in, in the appropriate metric. Okay, so uh, I thought that that was really a neat result. And part of it came from the Lipschitz property of that derivative which was inherited through implicit function theorem uh, from the properties of the, uh, of the derivative of the equilibrium map. And if you impose additional restrictions, remember we were talking only about candidate equilibria that uh, solve the fixed point system, and there are additional restrictions that assure that consumption never goes to zero, uh, the same kind of uh, theorem applies to equilibria. Okay, that also uh, satisfy the inequality requirements. And uh, just a few uh, words mainly, maybe about uh, uh, welfare. This is partial result. OK, it's not uh, complete. But just to give you a sense of, uh, sort of the, the beauty of the initial calculation, remember when we were calculating the uh, derivative of endogenous var variable with respect to exogenous variable, we needed to calculate Fourier transform or Laplace transform later, of the corresponding derivatives. And because the, all these derivatives are convolutions, in fact, Fourier transform can be decomposed into a very easy elementary blocks, right? It's a product of uh, elementary Fourier transform. So in fact, we can analytically calculate the uh, response of equilibrium variables to the changes to, as, as a result of uh, changes in exogenous variable. And what we have from that calculation is the Laplace transform of the derivative. And in fact, when we uh, are to calculate the derivative of welfare, uh, all we need to do is to calculate, just by definition, the Laplace transform of the, uh, the derivative of, uh, of, uh, of welfare. Um, because it's, it's, a, it's a weighted sum of utilities, of changes in utilities. It just falls into this def definition. So, in fact, as a byproduct of, of, this, uh, of this calculation, we have an explicit formula for welfare. And uh, it has, in fact, a very simple form. And we came back to the same formula that we had at the very beginning um, in, the, in the very first uh, result that I showed you, that indeed it's exponential. The time component is exponential. And the other component right, uh, is just the weights uh, uh, corresponds to weights uh, across um, ages, people, a lot. 
at that point in time. Okay. Well, that's about it. Okay, and then the idea there was to choose the simplest possible model to work yeah. with, okay? Yeah. So they <laughs> so, so, so the the time everybody in that economy lives for just the unit interval, right? They know exactly how long they, they're gonna work. So well no, hundred years, okay? One hundred years, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh yes, sure. Uh, again, this is an application of uh, relative utilitarianism. This it's a relative utilitarianism uh, yes. approach. Once again, it's uh, the the idea is that once uh, you have changes in equilibrium variables, they affect individual utilities. Individual utilities then are normalized between zero and one, and it's it's the sum of normalized individual utilities that we're calculating derivative of here. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you.